My name is Andrew Singletary, co-founder and CEO of 3 Laws Robotics. Today, we will discuss dynamic safety assurances for autonomous and human-operated systems. We will start with an introduction to dynamic safety in the background of 3 Laws. Then, we'll jump into the mathematics of safety filtering. We'll talk about the necessary conditions and constructions required to make an assurance of safety for a robotic system. We'll use this math as the backbone for how to construct a universal safety layer, which will be the final major topic of today's session. Applications and use cases will be sprinkled throughout, and you can expect around 20 minutes of content. Let's start with answering the question of what dynamic safety is and what Three Laws does. In order to understand dynamic safety, we must go to the root of the problem. As the world moves from machine automation to intelligent autonomy, the types of systems and the environments that they are deployed in are changing rapidly. Robots are required to interact more with people and other robots, and environments are becoming more dynamic and uncertain. Safety systems that only slow down or stop robots have performance limitations that limit their use in advanced autonomy. You can broadly break down safety systems into three categories. Static safety systems, like emergency stops, are safety functions like safe torque off that kill power to motors and ensure that systems come to a stop. These are critical for functional safety and fault management, but often result in production halts and downtime when used for things like collision avoidance. Kinematic safety systems solve one of the major issues with static safety systems. Rather than stopping, they slow down the system based on proximity to obstacles and other considerations. While these have lesser performance impacts, they still result in lower throughput and potential stops and gridlocks, particularly in multi-robot scenarios. Dynamic safety systems are the most advanced type of safety system. Rather than just slowing down or stopping, these systems can turn and avoid obstacles in real time. This has the lowest impact on performance as it keeps the robot in motion. Robots don't have to stop to stay safe. In this example of dynamic safety versus kinematic safety, we show an example of the safety system avoiding the human rather than just slowing down and stopping in front of it. This is especially valuable in multi-robot scenarios where gridlocks commonly result in downtime. The dynamic safety system running on both robots is able to prevent a safety incident while enabling both robots to reach the goal. Three Laws has been developing dynamic safety systems for over 10 years. The founders worked together at Georgia Tech and Caltech doing research in control barrier functions and enabling technology invented by Three Laws founder and professor Aaron Ames. This research was done in partnership with companies like Ford, Raytheon, BP, and more, solving critical safety issues across aerospace, automotive, and robotics. This research has resulted in a universal approach to dynamic safety that has been implemented on legged robots, manipulators, boats, fixed-wing aircrafts, and automotive systems. These are just a few examples of the hardware systems that leverage dynamic safety technology to enforce critical safety constraints without impacting performance. One thing to note before moving on to the mathematics of safety is that dynamic safety does not only have use cases in dynamic environments. Even in static settings without external sensing, things like geofencing shown in these examples in manipulation and aerospace can be valuable. Now, we jump into the mathematics of safety filtering. Let's look at the motivating example of a forklift operating next to a human. How does one determine a safe velocity for the forklift? This is going to depend on things like the heading of the forklift with respect to obstacles, the stopping distance of the forklift, the performance of the sensors on the system, and even things completely out of the forklift's control, like the actions of the human.
While standards like ISO 3691 provide guidance on maximum speeds based off of proximity to obstacles, such as those shown in the table, they do not describe how to compute operating speeds in general. It is up to the autonomy and safety engineers to determine what motion is safe and what isn't and to implement these rules and enforce them. The typical approach to this problem is to lump together many sources of uncertainty into conservative safety margins that are used to inflate obstacles and restrict motion in their vicinity. This results in a smaller operational space and speeds that are more limited than necessary due to heuristics and simplifications. Until recently, there was not a formal method for quantifying and propagating all of these sources of uncertainty into a specific constraint that can be enforced on the robot in real time. The math being presented here is one such method for accomplishing this task. Here is a similar example to the forklift. The machine learning based adaptive cruise controller on this semi truck was identified to have an edge case when large vehicles such as this van break more quickly than the algorithm anticipated. This results in possible collisions as demonstrated in this video. While the algorithm could be retrained to fix this specific safety issue, it would be impossible to guarantee that other edge cases wouldn't appear. A deterministic formal method that governs the motion of the truck would be the only alternative to very expensive and very extensive statistical validation methods. To answer this question of how to enforce safety, we will use the control barrier functions, or CBFs. CBFs offer the deterministic formal method that we require in order to quantify safety and enforce it on the vehicle. By representing safety as a function, we can ensure that the function stays positive, i.e. safe, by regulating the rate of change of that function. CBFs represent a necessary and sufficient condition for safety, meaning that it exactly quantifies the necessary condition without any added conservatism. In other words, the mathematics of safety can be represented by ensuring that this function always stays positive, which is done by ensuring that the system is not moving too quickly towards objects. This is illustrated by the drone's inability to run into the obstacle until it is moved. The safety filter that enforces the CBF condition, shown in red, is able to regulate the output of the adaptive cruise controller to deterministically enforce constraints on its motion relative to the motion of the fan. It takes in the desired steering, braking, and accelerator commands and modulates them when necessary to enforce safety constraints. In this case, it brakes slightly sooner and with more force than the algorithm was requesting, resulting in no collision. In this example, we're leveraging the safety filter to enforce both position and stability constraints on a Segway device. On the left, the base algorithm is being told to run into the boxes, and at the end, an unstable signal is sent that results in the Segway falling over. With the addition of the safety filter, both the position and stability constraints are enforced. The Segway stays within its desired operational envelope, despite the controller sending it unsafe commands. The same math is used in this example to keep Quadrotor from running into the wall. The pilot is telling the operator to run straight into the obstacle, which the safety filter presents until the wall is moved. In this final illustration of the math, we show how this scales to much higher speeds. The drone here free falls from 70 meters above the ground before the safety filter catches it. It's also able to enforce collision avoidance constraints at speeds above 100 kilometers an hour as shown a little bit later in this video. Now for the final section on how to leverage this math to create a universal safety filtering layer. 
The first step is to understand where in the stack such a filter belongs. There are two options, each with their pros and cons. Option A places the filter after the motion planning layer and before the embedded controls layer, in which case the inputs are trajectories, velocities, or accelerations. This layer typically runs at 10 to 100 hertz and allows for simple modeling and great platform flexibility. Option B has the safety layer at the output of the embedded controller right before the motor controllers. This would run in the 100 to 1 kilohertz range and allows for stronger safety assurances and better performance at the cost of more challenging implementation and modeling. Option A will result in significantly more universal safety layer, while option B can be appropriate for specific applications where safety and performance are especially critical. This is an example of a safety filtering implementation for the X62 Vista, an F-16 experimental test platform owned by the U.S. Air Force. This layer, called guardrails, was implemented by 3Laws to ensure that human and AI pilots conform to specific state limits, such as geofencing, altitude constraints, and angle of attack limits. Here, the guardrails sat at the output of the pilot and before the flight control system, running at 50 to 200 hertz. It would be dramatically more difficult for the safety layer to sit after the flight control computer due to the added difficulty in interfacing and modeling necessary. To illustrate why it is beneficial to exist before the embedded control layer, consider the difference between open loop and closed loop modeling of the system dynamics. Open loop modeling requires a deep understanding of how the control surfaces affect the motion of the aircraft. This is highly dependent on environmental factors like altitude and wind conditions, resulting in a significant modeling challenge. Closed loop modeling, on the other hand, allows you to leverage the existing high safety integrity level embedded controllers that were designed to track reference signals provided by the pilots. These often include disturbance rejection and stability guarantees that can be leveraged to simplify modeling and safety case generation. One of the challenges of dynamic safety is the need to handle more advanced sensing modalities than typical safety systems, like cameras and 3D LIDARs. More information on the environment is necessary to make decisions that dynamic safety systems must make, resulting in the need for these sensors. A universal safety layer must be able to handle things like smoke, dust, and adverse weather conditions to enable operations in challenging environments without stopping, like shown in this video. When dealing with non-safety rated sensors, such as the majority of cameras and 3D LiDARs, it is critical to have an advanced fault detection and management framework. Since the safety assurances rely on a variety of assumptions about the system and its environment, it's necessary to constantly check the validity of these conditions during operations. An example of one critical metric is dynamic consistency, which represents how well the model of the system is representing the real-time motion of the robot. Overcoming these challenges results in the benefit of a quantitative framework for assessing and managing the risk induced by different sources of uncertainty in real-world robotics deployments. Because of unbounded uncertainties and potential adverse actors, absolute guarantees of safety are impossible. Instead, a thorough understanding of the risks is required for safe deployments. Thank you all for coming to this talk. Please follow up with me if you have any questions.